of owning a cafe and other heroic deeds by Beware the Tristero, Chapter 43. Happy birthday, Mike! He'd gotten home that night at 22.37, the teens awake, alert, and waiting for him, feeling, Holy shit, Captain, where the hell did all of that come from? Ah! Later! At least we know of a way for him to make money after the cafe goes bankrupt, right? He shared the videos with them, and the three of them laughing on the couch showed had to admit that he'd been wrong to be so cautious. He, he had fun with someone else close to his age. And although both of them had agreed that there was no romantic spark between them, they'd hugged as friends, good friends, and had promised to make arrangements for an actual dance class together sometime over the summer. He had, however, felt his cheeks flushing when All Might sent him a message that night. You looked like you had a really good time. Thank you for sharing it with us. You, you will miss me more and more every day. God, what was he supposed to say to that? Why did it make his heart beat a little faster? Hmm. Then, having tucked himself into bed, he'd watched Loud Cloud, President Mike, and Sir Night Eye typing to each other back and forth within the group chat midnight had made. Loud Cloud. We're gonna have to bring our A game, guys. President Mike. Ha! Challenge accepted! I think that will blow Nimu down straight into the running! Sonata, let me guess. You're taking him to a karaoke bar? Are you sure that's wise? President Mike. I mean, how? I. Shit! President Mike loved the chat. Look that. Ooh, shields fire, dumb! I mean, Zashi, come on, man. He's got a point, you know? So, no, no, I meant no offense, but that was quite predictable, what did you say? President Mike entered the chat. President Mike. Okay, man, I take your point, but you'll never be my plan B! I got this in the bag, you'll see! Shut down, prepared to be amazed! Hilarious, <laughs> poor Mike. He'd have to call him later to make sure that he wasn't planning to go overboard, wouldn't he? Chuckling to himself, he locked his screen, shoved the device under his futon. After sending a quick text to Inko to let her know that he'd gotten home safely, she'd replied quickly and told him that she wanted all the details, if that's okay, when she saw him tomorrow, and settled down to sleep. All in all, he thought he could get used to this dating business. The week marched on, getting hotter with each passing day. His ice cream and brownie combo deals were selling out before the dinner time rush started. He'd have to order more ice cream, wouldn't he? It was quite cumbersome to make, and it wasn't worth the additional time or expense to buy a machine and make his own just now. However, on what should have been just an ordinary Wednesday afternoon, his youngest children speeding through their work and waving at the cats they were desperate to play with, he'd overheard a conversation whilst checking on his adult customers and bringing lemonade to Dobby, Tomra, and Spinner as they bickered their way through a new game. Ordinarily, he wouldn't have eavesdropped unless he'd thought that the wonderful camaraderie they'd been building together for the past two months could be in danger. He knew that children fell in and out of friendships, and he knew that was normal, but... But the thought of them sticking together, looking out for each other, and growing closer was something that he deeply wanted for them. Something that he knew would be beneficial for them, especially since they were all, for the majority, still fixed on such a dangerous career path. And yet, as he'd listened in, Izuku and his ward had decided to tell the group about the areas they wanted to specialize in. He needn't have worried. Katsuki, of course, had praised them for thinking about the additional services their agency would need and could offer to others. He'd gone as far as to say, No one will mess with us legally now, and we won't need to rely on hospitals too much either, which will mean we won't be using up civilian resources. Go work it so! The freckled boy had been delighted that the prince had swore to do his best whilst his older friend had finally rolled his eyes and said, We're not doing it just for you, Kachan, but we're behind you. Number one pro hero in the making. You're getting better as a leader, you know. You just need to stop saying die so much, all right? It'll make my job as your lawyer easier, okay? Then, not to be a dan, Ochago and Suyu told them that they wanted to hone their skills down a search-and-rescue route. Eijiro had already filled the position of Katun's number one sunken! Woo! Yeah! While Stanky, his cheeks blushing ashamedly, and asked his friends, oh, What can I do that would be more helpful? I mean, I'm kind of an airhead, and, well, my work is kind of all over the place, isn't it? 
He had watched, feeling a little pensive, his hands wiping down the table and ready to step in, when, to his continued joy and pride, the other children had leaned towards him across the study table. Are you kidding? Skatsky had grinned his smile fierce. You're like, beyond useful, he praised. So what if you don't know how to direct your cork yet? Deku can help you with that, he stated. Plus, we can all wear boots with rubber on them so we won't get shot when we're fighting together, right? To you, the person responsible for bringing the boy to the cafe in the first place, then curled an arm around him. Your crew can help people if there's a power outage to get them. You could keep a hospital running in an emergency and protect it from villains at the same time. Get up! Then Angelo, ever the compassionate child, hugged his other side. We want you with us even if you couldn't do any of that stuff too, you know? You're our friend. That already makes you special, okay? If he had to quickly walk away to compose himself as the tots indulged in a group hug after witnessing such a thing, well, only the cats he went to visit and a similarly teary at Tomoko, who'd watched the whole thing from the cat nest she manned, knew. They'd not dare to meet each other's eyes for fear of dissolving. However, he had brought them all a platter or two of onigiri to share as a study snack, his hands absently ruffling their hair as he'd done so. Such good kids! Then, as he went through the motions of a regular Saturday, the cat enclosure occupied by fawning MU students and a few celerymen, who were cooing over the cats like it was going out of style, he had to wander around his workspace to check on his customers, whores, and lodgers. For Tom Ra was only heading home every other day to do his homeschool work now. God, he was so glad that the younger teenager was staying over more often. He didn't like the thought of him being alone at night with the nightmares that plagued him on the regular. With everyone happily eating, talking, tapping away on laptops or phones, their shoulders relaxed and refreshing, iced tea drinks refilled, he made his way back to the service bar and reviewed his Sunday schedule. He and Itoshi, Dabby and his partner had wanted to come, however, the detention house rules only allowed visitors in two at a time, stupid court restriction laws, would set off for Tokyo at 700. They'd be back for 11.30. Mike's birthday was at 12.30 to 14.30, and 15 to 16.30, he'd be training the police force pair. Then the adult classes had been bunched together at 17 to 19, which meant that E and Mike would be sipping out together, baby! I'm going to treat you Sundays! At 20 hundred. <laughs> he was glad that they'd have so much to keep them busy after visiting Kimiko. His ward had been so brave about the whole thing, too. In fact, as he moved to refill some coffee for the cramming middle schoolers, the end of term exams were approaching, and they wanted to get as many high scores as they could before the end of term hit. He remembered that pain. The tot was sat with Izuku as they added to the memory book they were making for his mother that was spread across the study table. God, he was so glad that he had a friend who lived so close by. Similarly, he couldn't be happier that the teens he housed had taken such a pivotal role in Itoshi's life as well. For although Dobby was diligently checking on the customers, sipping iced tea and lemonade that side, Tomura was sat with the younger children, his hands offering photos to glue into the book. Furthermore, even though she shouldn't be, she'd refused to be paid for it too. Tomoko was busily cleaning around the cat enclosure with Minne assisting. Hmm, if he wasn't mistaken, there was a friendship budding there. Uh, maybe something more? The ebony-haired pro had winked at him when he nodded at the emerald-haired woman who, at the time, had been cuddling the two tots and excitedly praising them as her adorable little bros. Her brows waggling. God, he couldn't have been gladder. Seeing the pair of them happy and potentially developing a deeper relationship gave him hope for himself and everyone else who came through his cafe's door, too. Maybe Spinner was right, and there was a touch of magic in that little cat-eared bell that hung over the door. <laughs> what an illogical thought. Rosing Katoshi up in the suit that Tomra had bought for him, the pair had bid the teens goodbye and gotten into the unmarked police car that Sugarame-san had sent to collect them, the memory book in hand. Then, half an hour later, they were stood in the visitor's car park, the friendly officer giving them a number to call when their time was up. The detention house was huge. Letting out a quiet sigh, his ward's little hand clasped in his own. They walked up a short step of stairs and entered into the austere lobby where an officious pufferfish corked man shoved tablet at him with an electronic form to fill in. I <laughs> saw. However, with his three pieces of evidence to confirm his identity. Really? viewed, scanned, and logged alongside them, both having to have their photographs taken, 
He supposed such measures were necessary these days. With visitor badges assigned, they were finally allowed to go through. Reaching down to pick the child up, his little face relieved. They wandered down a few tall, wide, echoing, peach-painted corridors behind a much more friendly man. Actually made out of bricks! Until they reached a small corridor-like room filled with booths. He'd warned Hitoshi beforehand, of course. He'd be able to see his mother on the opposite side of the glass, but they wouldn't be able to touch her, and the words that they shared with each other would be recorded. God, he could understand these kinds of measures for a villain or a criminal part of a gang, but to keep a child from his mother, his mother, who he'd argued was more a victim herself than anything else, well, it was wrong. So wrong. And yet, when they'd spoken about today's visit yesterday evening, he'd showed him photographs so he knew what to expect, the tot had sucked in a breath, set his shoulders, and said, This makes me want to become a lawyer even more, Shoney. This system has got to be made fairer, right? Damn, he couldn't have been prouder if he'd tried. Okay, Aizawa-san, Shinzo-kun, please make your way to booth 7. You'll be given a 10-minute warning before your time's up, and I must remind you that any attempts to make contact with inmate B2477 will... Hey, he cut in, his eyes narrowed. We know and understand your rules, sir, he stated, his arms curling protectively around the saddened child he held. Shinzo san is a person, not a number, and she is this wonderful young man's mother besides. He snipped, cocking a brow in him, those milky mortar-colored eyes looking to the boy, the terracotta-colored person guard, huffed at a sigh. Forgive me, he said with a little bow. Procedure is procedure, and we, um, we don't tend to receive visitors who were so young, he admitted. I'm sorry, Shinzo kun He furthered, your mom has already sat there and waiting for you, okay? The time they'd spent together had flown by. Kimiko, despite where she was, seemed brighter than ever. Gone were the dark circles under her eyes, and since she'd been allowed to, she proudly showed off some of the courses she started in a paper ring binder, her face just as determined as her son's. She'd adored the memory book, her tone filled with excitement as she asked the child all about his birthday. The cats? She'd become a little teary when Hitoshi proudly told her that he'd named the Bombay kitten after his father his schoolwork, and she'd veritably squealed when he told her about his career ambitions. It would have been a lovely time, if not for the passive-aggressive walking of the guards, multiple CCTV cameras, and the five inches of quirk-resistant glass bracketed between them. But things could have been worse, couldn't they? They were here, they would come here every three weeks, and thank goodness, she was looking well. He couldn't see any evidence of maltreatment, and she'd even mentioned once or twice that she'd been befriended by some other women who were there under similar circumstances, and two of the women she'd known from the brothel were also in her low-risk wing, their cells in the same block. She also told them that the food was okay. It's nothing compared to yours, Shota-kun. That she got to work in the garden twice a week, and since she'd shown such an interest in catering courses, she was going to start working in the wing's kitchen soon. Then I can help you with your baking and cooking when we're back at the cafe together, can't I? God, if you're gonna bust in through that glass, scooped both of them up and made a run for it in that moment, then he would have. Shit! Your visit ends in ten minutes. Glaring at the little speaker shoved between them and lodged in between the glass, the eatery owner excused himself to get a couple of sodas from the vending machine behind him. It was hot in the room, and he wanted the boy to have something cool to drink before they got back into the car he'd have to call for when they were in the lobby. His brows furrowed. It wasn't right that the boy to be so near and yet so far from his only living parent, was it? What did they really think that she could or would do to him, or vice versa? He could only give them this small modicum of privacy, too, couldn't he? You've got to stay positive for him, if nothing else. It wouldn't do for him to see you becoming upset. It wouldn't help Kimiko, either. He thought, you can only do so much. He told himself, making the best out of bad situations is something you could teach a class in by now, right? The drive back to the cafe had been... quiet. Itoji had curled into him, but... After a little coaxing, the child had started to talk, relax, and they'd both sang along to a song their police escort had put on the radio. Then, once they were back home, the memory book in hand, and ready for whatever other adventures they had coming, they'd bid the cat-headed man goodbye and gone inside, 
Only until later, though, the police force pair were more than happy to work with him outside on the AstroTurf since the course they were hoping to pass would be intense. Nabi and Domra, such good kids, had wrapped their little brother up in affectionate hugs and spirited him away to where Izuku was awaiting his return, the freckled pot reaching for him and taking him to the cat enclosure where Tomoko, now a permanent and much-loved fixture in their lives, was poised to provide them both with cuddles and feline fun. Watching them go, his shoulders sagging in relief, he adventured upstairs to remove his tailored pants and button-down shirt, and slipped into jeans and the pushing t-shirt he'd been gifted with thanks to Spinner and his grateful parents a few days ago. What did he ever do to deserve such amazing people? Grinning to himself at their thoughtfulness, his hair tied up again. He'd blinked and nearly walked into his first lodger, his mouth opening to apologize when the 16-year-old had pulled him into an embrace which he'd returned. You're doing great, Kit, Dad, he'd whispered before pulling away. Just don't go running yourself where I get, okay? He cupped the other's shoulders, promised him that he wouldn't, and then headed back down the stairs with him. Once in the kitchen, his favorite domain, he got out the large candy-covered cake. Mike had quite the sweet tooth, it seemed. To chuck it over whilst Dabby greeted Midnight and Loud Cloud, their arms loaded with party supplies. He then helped them alongside Tomoko, whilst Tomer and his partner continued to oversee the Tats and their cat companions, to set up the streamers and position the gifts for the enthusiastic blonde who'd be with them in half an hour's time. And between the four of them? Well, the cafe looked suitably festive, and with a loop of the DJ Come Hero's favorite songs filtering through the sound system, he'd helped to set up the Nodon Echo. Everything looked and sounded just right. He'd even fried some chicken in a western-styled batter, which was apparently the Jedi man's favorite dish, heathen, and made a simple yet delicious slaw to go with it. He would not be making french fries. The stench of boiling fat for the crispy golden brown drumsticks and thighs had been enough to turn his stomach. Thank you. Then the food prepared in a cards against humanity, Loud Cloud had insisted. Men I had rolled her eyes at Domingo and snickered. He wasn't sure what to think. An R-rated card game that the kids couldn't enjoy seemed an odd choice of activity for him. Game set up, the birthday boy bounced in with his usual verve, his golden hair no longer in that frankly quite ridiculous, but he never said so to his face, that big old Garrus style, but mostly loose with some strands crafted into a beautiful half ponytail. The bro still sported that, and he called it cute? God awful mustache, though. Dobby had snickered the first time he'd seen it and called it a low grade pornthash. Ah! It was wrong of him to agree, but he couldn't help but think that the voice cork user would look better without it. Still, who was he to criticize? He didn't know anything about fashion, and if Zash she liked the look, then he'd support him being who he was, of course. Wow! Show! Guys! This is great! Thank you! Welcoming him into the cafe proper, Izuku and Hitoshi springing up from where they'd hidden at the end of the service bar to shower in with party streamers. The five twenty-some-year-olds started to share out gifts and food whilst the teens and tots retreated to the cat enclosure. All in all, he could chalk up yet another success in birthday stakes, couldn't he? Eh. And with Izuku's being celebrated next Sunday, on the 14th, he just knew that things would turn out for the better. Hell, if the kid enjoyed his presence and party with the same energy as Mike. Mm, this is the best fried chicken I've ever had! How do you keep blowing me away, show chat? Then he'd probably be able to run his electricity straight off of the kid, wouldn't he? Happy birthday, Sashi! Ah, it felt good to see so many people enjoying themselves, didn't it? <laughs>